Coming up next on Under the Radar Michigan, we travel to Charlevoix for a burger bistro that foodies frequent. We'll also see homes that you swear hobbits inhabit and meet a local superhero they affectionately call Mr. Petunia. Then we tour Detroit in a very unique way, on a Segway. We'll also prove that grocery shopping in Detroit can be a very enlightening experience. And we'll go to the movies in style. Get ready to explore the cool people, places, and things that make Michigan a great place to be. Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing and Development Authority, investing in people, places, and partnerships to help transform Michigan and the Michigan economy. In cities, towns, and neighborhoods, people are building better places to live and better communities. Also by the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure. The Komen Race for the Cure series raises significant funds and awareness for the fight against breast cancer, celebrates breast cancer survivorship, and honors those who have lost their battle with the disease. More info at Komen.org. Also in part by the Food Bank Council of Michigan, Michigan's statewide food bank network, committed to the alleviation of hunger in Michigan and in our nation. The Food Bank Council of Michigan gathers food and funds to help stock Michigan's food banks. And by Danielle Carmanis' Work It Out, a program that gives children the tools to make healthy choices. The Work It Out mission is to eradicate childhood obesity and promote health in mind, body, and spirit through a yoga-based approach that reduces anxiety and increases self-esteem. Information at dkwio.org. I've been around the world, but there's one place I keep coming back to. And the more I explore, the more I realize it's the place to be. I'm Tom Dalton, and this is Under the Radar Michigan. How do I even begin to describe Charlevoix? It really is one of the most beautiful towns in Michigan. On one side, you've got Round Lake and passage to Lake Charlevoix. And on the other side is Lake Michigan, so if you're into life on the water, it's absolute heaven. Charlevoix has a comfortable sophistication about it that says, hey, I ended up in the right place. It's a small town that really leaves you with a big impression. Charlevoix is located in northwest lower Michigan, halfway between Traverse City and the Mackinac Bridge. Forbes.com just named Charlevoix, Michigan, one of America's most beautiful cities. And a lot of it's because of one person. Now, I've heard of Mr. Rogers. I've heard of Mr. Ed, I've even heard of Mr. Potato Head, but Mr. Petunia? Meet Dale Boss, AKA Mr. Petunia. He's lived here for all of his 80 years and he's a man with a single mission, to make Charlevoix beautiful. 30 years ago, he launched an effort to plant five miles of petunias through the heart of the city. The program took root and every summer for the past three decades, Mr. Petunia has headed out at 4 a.m. seven days a week to water his beloved flowers. He's put more than 40 million gallons of water on almost 2 million petunias. See, I, for some reason, I pictured you walking along with a big watering can, but I guess that, that'd take a long time. That'd take a long time. A real long time to water this many petunias. Yeah, tell me about this truck, because I've never seen it. This is, this is obviously a custom-made truck. This is a custom-made truck. I had it manufactured to do the job. And lucky for Charlevoix, it's a job that Dale is completely dedicated to. And when I say dedicated, I mean dedicated. You've been doing this for 30 years. I've done it for 30 years and I've never missed a day when it needed it. What time do you get up again? I get up about quarter of four. <laughs> oh my gosh, quarter of four in the morning. I walk back in the house at seven o'clock. How many petunias are there? There are 60,000 plants. 1,250 flats. Well, who plants them all? We have a big party on about the 25th of May. We get a thousand people in the street. We get them put in in about an hour and 15 minutes. Wait a minute, you plant 60,000 petunia in an hour and 15 minutes? That's right. When we get all done, why everybody goes down in the park and we have a big picnic. It really makes a difference when you drive into town. It's just a beautiful sight to see all these flowers. Yeah, well, it's been very rewarding. Puts a lot of smiles on people's faces, and really, that's what life's all about, you know. But it really takes someone like you to make it happen. Not everybody would get up at quarter to four every morning and come out and do this for 30 years straight. That's right. It takes Mr. Petunia. Yeah. You're a superhero. Where's your cape? <laughs> you need a Mr. Petunia cape. 
Oh dear. What do you love about Charlevoix? It's got an awful lot of nice people here. And Dale Boss is no exception. Quite honestly, if there were more people like Mr. Petunia in the world, it'd be a much better place. But Michigan is lucky to have him right here in Charlevoix. It's just a plain nice place to live. You said it, Mr. Petunia. Now let's eat. You know, I wanted to come to this restaurant for one reason and one reason only. Well, actually two reasons. One, I hear the chef's a really nice guy and he makes incredible local fresh food. But the other reason is, what's with the name Roquette's Burger Bistro? What's Roquette mean? How do you even say it right? It does sound kind of fancy, though. Well, however you say it, Paul Ramey has created a sophisticated little place that takes the term burger joint to a whole different level. What's up with the name? What is Ro it's Roquette's Rock Rocket. It's just a French word for arugula. Um, and years ago, my wife and I fell in love with it. We started growing too much Rocket. So we started selling it to other people. And our little farm business became Rocket Farm. And that name just kind of stuck with us. Okay, now that we've got this whole Rocket thing down, it's important to note that this Burger Bistro is kicking out more than just burgers. It's a full-on local food experience hosted by a full-on food nut. Consider yourself a food geek? Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would push it that far. I mean, I, I eat, sleep, drink food. I mean, if, if it's a spare moment, I'm thinking about food. And lucky for us, a while back, Paul started thinking about burgers. When I came up with the idea of a burger place, I came up with that idea because I wanted a good burger and I couldn't find one. Um, so I finally said, you know, I'm gonna make a good burger. Then I started sourcing beef and I started sourcing other ingredients. And I'm like, if I'm going to go through all this effort to make good food, then I'm going to make everything. You know, I'm going to start making my ketchup. I'm going to start making my pickles. Yeah, because you don't seem like the kind of guy that would have the food service truck pulling up out back. Um, it, that creates a problem for me because uh, those those times when I do need some of those food service items, I don't have the trucks pulling up. I have to physically go out and get those things and bring them back to the restaurant. I mean, my day starts with. You know, I've got to get to this farm, I've got to get to this farmer's market, you know, I've got to pick up my beef. So you know the guy that's producing, the, or that's giving you your beef. Oh, you, yeah. you know the people that are giving you your vegetables, I, your I know, I know these cows intimately, you know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I know them before they're burgers. And the beauty of that is, uh, you know, there's, there's great food here in northern Michigan. Coincidentally, Paul gained his appreciation of local foods in this area from one of our former esteemed UTR guests. These guys were deeply ingrained in local food long before local food was cool. Right. Um, right. And I didn't understand that. I, I didn't understand that appreciation when I met him and I started working for him. But when I started making preserves and saw that, you know, simple ingredients treated properly make great food. Right. Um, that kind of sparked the obsession. Everything's full circle. We're going back to what the right way to do things, which is you buy what you're going to eat that day or the next exactly. because it's fresh. And that's part of the beauty of northern Michigan is, is you have distinct seasons. Right. But the beauty of seasonality is is when asparagus is in season, right. celebrate asparagus. You know, do everything you can with asparagus, and then when it's gone, miss it. Just like we're going to miss Rocket Burger Bistro. I mean, when you've got this kind of passion behind your food, there's no doubt you're going to eat well. I want this to be an experience when you step in here, you know. I want that first bite to to drip down your chin and down your fingers. Stop, I haven't eaten much. <laughs> well, Rocket Burger Bistro sure was a fulfilling experience, with the emphasis on both full and filling. Have you ever wondered where the hobbits go? You know, when they leave the Shire and go on vacation? Well, I'm pretty sure they come here to Charlevoix, because I think I just found a couple of their houses. Come on, I'll show you. Some people call them the mushroom houses, and others say that actual gnomes live here. All I know is the only place you'll see them is Charlevoix, and they're all the work of one man, Earl Young. From 1918 through the 50s, Earl designed and built 30 homes in Charlevoix, and they range from the whimsical to the bizarre to the spectacular. All this from a guy who dropped out of architecture school. 
I hooked up with Marsha Braun from the Charlevoix Historical Society, and she shares a great love for these unique homes. Now, you didn't tell me we were going to see the, the house where the Verners gnome lives today. <laughs> no, but it would be a perfect one. It fit beautifully. Oh, yeah. This is the one that really, um, I think, has given many of them that kind of tag is the gnome homes, the troll yeah. house. Um, it's really so whimsical. I once heard someone describe Earl's style on yeah. this house as um, Frank Lloyd Wright meets Fred Flintstone. What is the, this house looks like? It looks like the roof melted almost. Well, it's not melted. This is actually the most photographed home in Charlevoix. Yeah. It's called the Mushroom House. Oh, the Mushroom and House. And it I gets see. its name, obviously, from this wonderful shape of this circular roof. It uh, actually sits on a, uh, a real old fashioned L shaped footing. Um, but Earl came in and started putting the stones down. And Earl. I know, what a guy. And in some places, the walls are as much as three feet thick. The um, windows are actually from a Polish castle. They, yep, they had been brought over and used oh. in a lumber baron's house in southern Michigan. So he was kind of a recycler even then, which is kind of interesting. Ahead of his time, for right. sure. There's something so organic, and there's the flow to it. It looks like there's no plan, and hence there's like a plan. Exactly. As you look at all of uh, Earl's work, you'll see it is all natural materials. Um, it is uh, part of the landscape always. It really looks like, in some cases, he laughs that he used to build his roofs first and, and shove the houses up underneath them. All right. And all right. they are truly um, an exa examples of organic architecture. We're very, very lucky to have them, and they are in such wonderful shape and have just really withstood the test of time. Checking out these great homes with Marsha was a real treat. But honestly, if you really want to get an appreciation for Young's work, you got to get here to see it for yourself. And you won't have to look far. There are examples of his unique style all over town, including a spectacular fireplace he built at the Weathervane Inn that, strangely enough, resembles a certain state I love, which just happens to be home to the beautiful city of Charlevoix. Man, I love this town. There's so much developing and happening in Detroit right now that every time you turn around, there's another reason to come here. You can feel the change in attitude and energy. So if you've got a spirit for adventure and discovery, this is a great place to be. You know, Detroit is a great city and there's a right way and a wrong way to tour it. But you know me, I've always got to be different. So what did I do? I picked the Segway. It's right in here. If you're looking for cool things to do in Detroit, look no further, because Jeanette Pierce and the folks at Inside Detroit will totally hook you up. What exactly is Inside Detroit? Our mission is to educate the public about Detroit's history, culture, community, and livability um, in order to spur economic development. But we do it all from an insider's perspective. What made you personally get so involved in this project? Well, I'm a born and raised Detroiter, so I've always lived in the city. Grew up in, on the east side of the city. Um, I lived downtown now for eight years. And it was when I moved downtown that I realized that there was a lot I didn't know. And you start walking places and, and getting in conversations with the small business owners and knowing those people. Um, it's a, just a different city. And I was like, wow, how did I miss all of this? Now, you do, what are some of the services you guys have? What are some of the tours you do? Yeah, we do all sorts of tours. So everything from history and architecture to bars and restaurants, to places to live, to community groups, the whole spectrum. And we do them all, all kinds also. Walking tours, bus tours. And Segway tours. Now, I know what you're thinking. Tom's going to kill himself. But believe it or not, the learning curve on one of these things is literally about three minutes. They're so intuitive that before you know it, you and the Segway are one. And off you go. Let's go! We are going to start the tour by heading to Campus Marshes Park and Cadillac Square before we hit Hart Plaza, the Riverwalk, the Dequinder Cut, and more. OK, here we go into Campus Marshes Park. Try not to get hit by cars. Man, it's great to see Campus Marshes with all the live music and all the people. It's one of the most successful redevelopment projects in recent years, and this past year was number one transformative park in America. All right, so you've probably gathered by now that Jeanette is a guru of all things Detroit. And as if the segways weren't enough, her energy made touring the city serious fun. 
Eight years I've been downtown, there was no campus marshes before. There were no beautiful streetscapes. The YMCA, the Book right. Cadillac Hotel, right. all of these things, the Como they just announced, the Broderick Tower, all sorts of amazing things being announced and coming to fruition. And it's really an exciting time to be here. Hey, that sounds like something I'd say. So the Riverwalk will eventually be five and a half miles from the Ambassador Bridge all the way to the Belle Isle Bridge. It's beautiful. We have three miles of it completed right now, and it's one of the most popular new developments in the city of Detroit. Sure, we may have looked a little funny, but when we were done, we all had a whole new perspective on the Motor City. If you want to get inside Detroit, you totally have to try this. It's so easy and fun, and you see so much, and you cover so much ground so quickly. And like I said before, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Even you. I'm off. Tom Dalton, danger seeker, troubleshooter, investigative reporter. You know, there's a lie being perpetrated that there's no good grocery stores in the city of Detroit. That's not true. I know this because my director, Jim, is a huge foodie. Well, actually, he's regular size, but he's really into food, and he knows good food, and he found a place for us to shop in Detroit that has incredible stuff. That's right. If you're looking for a first-class grocery shopping experience, you actually have to come to Detroit, not leave it, because the Honey Bee Market in Mexican Village is all that, and then some. Wow, what an awesome, oh, guacamole. <laughs> I love guacamole. Not counting the guacamole, the first thing that hits you here is how well put together it is. The selection is truly international, and if you can't find something, help is never far away. You can tell that owners Tammy and Ken Kohler have a ton of pride in this market. The crew is always teasing me because every time we go someplace, I'm always, this is the best I've ever had. This is the nicest I've ever seen. But I, I'm being completely honest. When I walked in here, I was totally struck with, I've never seen a, a grocery store as clean or as well organized as this place. Is this, did, does this stuff all accidentally happen or how, what's, what's your plan? <laughs> We want it to be a shopping experience for everyone in, in the neighborhood. We want to serve the community. Right. We want to give them some hope and joy. Um, so that's what our accomplishment is. And, and I see new faces and people that really do enjoy coming in here to shop. And how could they not? You know what I love about this place is you've got all the normal foods that I'm used to, because not that I say that I'm normal, but, <laughs> but you have exotic foods that you don't find anywhere else. Would you mind, like, taking a couple minutes just to show me some of the more, the things that I'm not familiar with? Sure. I'll that, take you. That would be awesome. But just give me a real quick second. I'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Okay. Sorry, Tammy. I just had to make sure, oh, my, I make sure my lights, I didn't leave my car lights on. Anyway, um, I've never seen this many peppers or this many varieties of peppers in my life. I, I recognize hottest. those are really, really hot ones. Yep, those are hot, and so are these. These are one of the two hottest ones. That we have. Yeah, peppers. Boy, that makes me uh, makes me uh, make me think of something I have to do. I'll be right back. Uh, da, 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 yeah. uh, these are pretty nice peppers. I'm gonna try cooking with these. I don't know what it is, but it smells great. Yeah, sorry, Tammy. Uh, the sun's still there. I just had to check. Oh, okay. Now this looks like cactus. Do you do people actually eat cactus? Yes, they do, and it's delicious. It's delicious. It's delicious. How do you how do you cook this? How would you, you eat this? You boil that, and then after you boil, you have to skin it. Right. And then once you skin it, you just slice it up and you put it in omelets. Right. Very good for breakfast. One of my favorite ways is in a salad, a cactus salad, where you add the cilantro and the tomato and the onion, the jalapenos. Oh, I love the cilantro. And Mexican cheese is in there, and cucumber, and you just use a tortilla chip and right. just eat it. Ah, just eat it. Yes, I can do that. Oh, what's this exotic fruit here? That is an apple. Manzana. Hey, how about that? I learned a new word today. But more importantly, I learned that not only can you find good groceries in Detroit, you can find great groceries in Detroit. And great people, too. But, hey, I already knew that. But this is our home, really. We treat it like our home. And our home is your home. So. Thanks. I'm part owner. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> well, like all things, our great time at the Honey Bee had to come to an end eventually. But, uh... Not before one last trip to the guacamole bar. Don't! The name the Detroit Film Theater is one of those names that, well, in one way, it describes exactly what this place is. It's a theater that shows films in Detroit. But on the other hand, it really doesn't do justice to how cool this place is or why it's so important to the city of Detroit. And who better to explain that than founder and curator Elliot Wilhelm? Man, I thought I loved movies. Before we get into talking about the film theater, I wanted to get a better sense for your history. 
So if you could, Elliot, may I call you Elliot? Certainly can. Thank you. Uh, give me your best, I've got 60 seconds to impress that girl over there <laughs> and, and tell her how I became a film expert. Well, it's probably not going to impress her because I didn't do sports when I was a kid. I didn't do the stuff that other kids did except go to the movies. And that's pretty much what I did, at least every Saturday when other kids were running around doing regular kid stuff. I went to the matinees about giant insect movies and dangers from outer space and was completely hooked on movies from the age of really five or six. And the problem is I just never stopped. And it just yeah. kept going and going and going. And loving movies the way I did, what I really enjoyed doing was taking other people to movies that I really liked. And that, in a sense, is what led to the profession I have now, which is to bringing films to a larger public and bringing films that I think are important, wonderful, and significant in some way to the largest audiences I can possibly scare up. I would definitely encourage anybody to come down. There's a richness to the variety of films and uh, events that you're allowed to see. If you love films, if you love you know, art, culture, it's, it's a great experience. It's an opportunity to really get involved and to see um, films and things that you wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to see in another venue. And I just have a great time coming down. It's a whole end of the spectrum that people are missing if they're just going to see the big Hollywood blockbusters. Well, it's a different way of seeing a film. And of course, we have nothing against Hollywood blockbusters. In fact, I think the term independent film uh, is often misinterpreted because people tend to think of independent film as something that is made cheaply, made on your parents' credit cards. Right. But independent film can be a film of any budget at all as long as the vision is a passionate one and an right. independent one. It's just not a part of the big, the giant studio system. Often. But even studio films, films like, uh, say, The Godfather years ago, mm -hmm. uh, those I consider to be independent visionary movies, even though they were based on a big bestseller right. and were right. wildly popular. They were clearly made by an artist who wanted to tell a story and to tell a story well. So we don't discriminate against a movie just because it was expensive to make. And right. we also right. don't discriminate against movies just because they were inexpensive to make. Uh, the only distinction we make is that somebody really wanted to tell a story and to tell that story passionately, as passionately as possible. It's great to have a theater like this that's actually used. One of the wonderful things about this place is that people do use it. So it is an important site, not just historically, not just because, yes, here's a beautiful old theater that used to get used. It's a beautiful old theater that still gets used, and people are just delighted to, to see it and to use it. Uh, you come here on a Friday evening and you watch people going through the DIA and having a good time, listening to music, going to the restaurant, looking at the art, coming to see a film in here. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a really major pleasure center. It's, it's not just a museum. It's a destination for a lot of reasons. And seeing a film here is a destination for a lot of people and has been for, for decades. All right, so yes, as the name suggests, the Detroit Film Theater is a theater that shows films. And yes, it's in Detroit. But once you've experienced it, I guarantee you'll need a lot more words than that to tell your friends about it. You'll also need a lot of words to tell your friends about all the great things going on in Detroit right now. Because there are so many that, well, I just don't have enough words. And that's a first. I just have one final question for you, and be honest with me. Did you cry when Bruce Willis was left on that asteroid in Armageddon? Be honest. Uh, yes, because he wasn't left sooner. Huh? Oh, boy, have you ever gone to somebody's website and you get there and it's kind of disappointing? Well, you should go to utrmichigan.com because if you've never been there before, you won't know what to expect, so you can't be disappointed. So you can go to our visitor's guide and find out places we've been, tell us where to go. You can jump to our Facebook page or even find out where to get a hat like mine, huh? So go to utrmichigan.com, and I promise you will not be disappointed. Watch. Aha! I love it. <laughs> Under the Radar Michigan is brought to you in part by the Michigan State Housing and Development Authority, investing in people, places, and partnerships to help transform Michigan and the Michigan economy. In cities, towns, and neighborhoods, people are building better places to live and better communities. Also by the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure. The Komen Race for the Cure series raises significant funds and awareness for the fight against breast cancer, celebrates breast cancer survivorship, and honors those who have lost their battle with the disease. More info at Komen.org. Also in part by the Food Bank Council of Michigan, Michigan's statewide food bank network, committed to the alleviation of hunger in Michigan and in our nation. The Food Bank Council of Michigan gathers food and funds 
to help stock Michigan's food banks. And by Danielle Carmanis Work It Out, a program that gives children the tools to make healthy choices. The Work It Out mission is to eradicate childhood obesity and promote health in mind, body, and spirit through a yoga-based approach that reduces anxiety and increases self-esteem. Information at dkwio.org. Closed captioning for Under the Radar Michigan is made possible by Shamrock Travel in downtown Rochester. Shamrock Travel, providing complete travel services right here in Michigan for over 20 years. Thank you.